Hello. Uh, hello, Hamanshu. Hello, everyone. Well, we had a discussion, a lot of discussion about this paper on the genomics of differentiation. I think that's great. I know Lucas was working on it quite a bit this weekend. And uh, we're going to go over a lot of that stuff. I, I did a deep dive into the literature on C. elegans differentiation. It's quite interesting, actually. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be keep working on that. Uh, I don't know if Lucas is going to be here today, but he sent me a version of the paper. Um, and then, of course, yeah. So, and then, of course, we have our GSOC students. Um, and I also got the document from Sushmont on MicroSAM, and I have that uh, in my tabs. Or you can share a screen as well, but just to go over that. Um, and then Hamanchu's here. So let's get started. Uh, who wants to go first with an update? I hope you are fine. Um, I started writing a paper about microsam uh, segment editing. It's skipped as a name as microscopy segment editing model. So microsam. I just given in that paper. I just give an gentle introduction about uh, using segment editing model for cell image segmentation. Hamanshu, could you go uh, while well, uh, Sushmant is setting up with your update? Just share my screen. All right. Oh, is it yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. So this this week, I uh, was basically working on uh, demograph and uh, trying to set up like the persistent homology, like the topological data analysis part and uh, the graph neural networks one part. So basically, uh, I had it shows in uh, like uh, starting with the demograph uh, part that like I was not able to uh, get the same results as previously before uh, because there was some issue in uh, the uh, just one second in the repository. I'll just share it over. Uh, yeah, okay, so in the requirements.txt, so basically, uh, the this is like out uh, different from what is actually working right now. So, uh, since the project was like a year ago and the requirements did not mention any versions or uh, the specific uh, versions that could be used, uh, so like I had to figure out what the exact version for it was and uh, I'll send an update to Jia Hang and tell him about this, like the get which devil to use and uh, which torch version and which DGL version is working because DGL uh, has been uh, updated as well, like it has gone to a, a version 1.0 and PyTorch has also gone to version 2.0, so uh, the interchangeable things of it is different right now. So. Uh, but then I uh, got it to work and the stage 2 code is uh, right now uh, working on my PC as well. So, uh, and I got the same results as uh, before, this one. So, my second stage is, as of now, uh, is to uh, get some uh, papers done, like uh, this uh, topological graph neural networks paper and uh, I've been looking at the GitHub repository for a while and uh, trying to figure out what how exactly they uh, used it and how we can uh, like try to get uh, similar results for uh, our task that is for cell tracking and they have done it on uh, classification tasks like node and uh, edge, edge classification uh, so Basically, uh, what they have used is something called as uh, Torch Persistent Homology Repository, which is uh, different from what uh, most of the people have been using, that is the Tiger TDA one. Uh, so right now, I'm just figuring out uh, how to get into GN and TDAs and once I get a small example code ready for uh, our data set, I'll move on to the cell tracking part and try to get 
uh, try to resolve the issues like or try to solve the problems that Jia Hung has al had also mentioned in the previous meets. Like uh, since our data is like there is some kind of rotational in the cell uh, differentiability and uh, also the other issue as well. Uh, like uh, since uh, this paper only considers like the static graphs and our graphs are dynamic. So we'll have to figure out that that is one of the challenges uh, as well. So right now I'm uh, doing literature to review on that. Okay. Uh, once I give an example, I'll uh, move on to the next step. Okay. So my work this week would be like to uh, get a working example ready for uh, TOGLs, but on static uh, a static uh, graph data. Which is of uh, cells. All right. So, what would that look like? Like, uh... Uh, so the it will be similar to the steps that was given in the previous paper. Like, basically, we'll have the input data which will be processed, and in the temporal graph section, we'll also have like a static graph uh, of which we'll extract topological features of it. And then along with that, the GNN and uh, with the help of that, we can get the output embeddings. Right. Uh, which is uh, which is what these guys have done as well, like the ICLR guys. Okay. And this paper is what is this paper? Uh, this paper is like uh, they have applied topological data analysis on uh, vanilla GNNs. Okay. So yeah, I'll I'll uh, send this paper as well, and I also found a different paper uh, on GNNs, which is like uh, which was released this year. I'll uh, I'm I'll trade on that, and if it's useful, I'll uh, send that as well on the Slack channel. All right, that sounds great. Yeah, great. Hey, but, uh, you have problem with stage one or stage two? Uh, my problem was actually uh, integrating and stage two. So basically, actually, stage one and stage two are never integrated. Uh, stage one was running on different Python version, and stage two was a yeah, uh, yeah. And whatever CSV file we are extracting in stage one, that is not used in the stage two. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, we are never integrated uh, stage one. You can run separately stage one, and you can run separately stage two. Yeah, uh, then it will work. But combinedly, they are never integrated, and that is the hard part because a stage two needs uh, cell image analysis. That is the main reason. Uh, with Devolan, we are not able to create the CSV file with cell centroids and cell image analysis. So that's what the issue is. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now, I'm doing that only. I have two separate quant environments for stage one and stage two, and they have different Python versions and yeah. uh, all of that. Like. Also, you uh, we also started to update our the table and your repository as well. Like, do you change the uh, functions to by using the SkyCard library functions for uh, like image processing and everything? And also, like the dependency was updated, so I had to use a different table and for uh, to get my setup ready for stage two and stage. Uh, so right now, uh, so as of now, I'm using. Uh, Wataru's uh, fork of Devolon, and with that, my stage one is working. Yeah, there are so many active changes and deprecated libraries right now in Devolon. Yeah. I think before completing our GSAP, we need to update those all to make completely working, etc. Yeah. I will go through that. Alright. So, what's the plan for this coming week, Kamanchu? Like, uh, so, you... this week I'll I'll be doing a uh, uh, example for uh, the graph on TOGLs. Okay. Like the static graph TOGL, and then I'll move on to the next one uh, right. for dynamic graphs. All right, that sounds great. Yeah. All right, yeah, thanks for the update. Uh, glad to see your computer is back up and running. Uh, uh, yep. Having okay. trouble with that. <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is good. Uh, so, so Shamath, are you ready? Yeah. Okay.
think there is a problem with my laptop. Just two minutes, okay? It's not sharing. Oh. Just a minute. All right. So yeah, Sushma, so this micro SAM document, um, and it's basically an overview of his. Some of the proposed work on uh, microscopy image segmentation, the segment anything model, and uh, yes, we're trying to build a pipeline of papers here. So this is the first one, I guess, uh, where he's proposing that we have this version of SAM called MicroSAM that can do work on microscopy image, images specifically. It's just using the SAM methods of um, from Meta and applying it to this specific problem. So, okay. We're still working on getting up and running here with this. Uh, any questions, comments? Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, actually, I think my screen is sharing right now. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, right now, till these many days, I have the problem with my GPUs for training the model. But uh, yesterday, I bought some GPUs of uh, 100 compute units on Google Colab. Uh, uh, I started training the model. And parallelly, I was writing the whole paper for microscopy images of cell. Uh, I have implemented what I actually I shared the doc about it. I wrote an abstract, what it is doing, and etc. After that, I am giving a general introduction um, with that corresponding images. I am comparing our model with unit structure segmentation. Uh, yeah, that's what the idea is there in my mind. Exactly, I will be writing paper about cell segmentation using a uh, zero shot classification, zero shot segmentation from uh, SAM. And parallelly, I am writing, I am trying another model called DevoNet. Uh, <coughs> Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Open? Okay. Yeah, but I just see wow. the Jitsi window now. You get a, oh. get a, a different tab. Gosh. Just a minute. Oh, you shared the tab. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah I shared the right, tab. Right now you can, yeah. Uh, right now I bought the collab upgraded version. I am training the model. There are some little small bugs I need to uh, work with them out. Actually, the bug is just a shape error uh, for the loss function. Uh, this is a small error. Maybe by tomorrow I'll sort it out. And model will work, work fine, but uh, most of the main problem would be writing this paper. And yeah, uh, explaining every parameters needed for writing this paper. And uh, almost code is ready. We just need to train the model. and give it to me with fine tune with correct hyperparameters. Uh, this complete week I couldn't work at most because I was having a fewer and I couldn't manage my work. But this week I will try try to complete train the model and I will write the complete paper about what is you know, what is happening with our model and how it is implementing, what are the accuracy with our compared to other models, etc. Uh, Bradley this talk will I will make changes complete week. Please give a look at the end of the week and let me know like what all changes do I need to make. After this paper, I will start working on the DevoNet which I have proposed in my of proposal. I will train that and I will write a separate paper on that also. Uh, that would be one. And Devolan, uh, actually Jyoti attended today's meeting for Devolan thing only. He started reading the talk which you have shared and he will start writing papers from tomorrow about Devolan etc. Uh, maybe from next week onwards he will also give the update about the paper etc. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I hope this. Uh, I think the vocabulary all good. I think is good, right? In the paper, uh, try to just write a basic thing. Yeah, this is it's always hard to know because there's so much jargon in that field, like how if you're using it correctly or if that's this is meant for like a, a technical audience or a general audience, or what's the I want to publish as a, a conference paper or something like that. Okay. I don't really don't know about how these papers work, but I want to, what I am doing in my work in my GSOP, I just want to make it as a research paper or some kind of general paper because we are building tools which someone can use for cell segmentation. Right. So, 
yeah that could be a paper i think so like make sam which i've showed the last week they have published in the archive i think their paper like that only we are working on the microscopy cell images we can show it some like here work on it okay yeah. i will try to make draft of all papers and i will share it to you after reading them you decide whether it is up to mark for a journal paper or for a conference or something kind of just publishing in our okay that would be and uh, my uh, i really i think uh, there is something with the deadline thing it was not updated on my gsoft oh yeah the yeah i, I they take care of it at incf i'll probably have to tell them closer to the time because i don't think it's like i think they do this later in the uh program. actually oh uh, yeah actually some p some members who were selected to these students their portal got updated with the extended uh, deadline is this through uh, incf or another word incf only actually jyoti swarup was selected for other projects his uh he got uh, uh his profile got changed for extended deadline till october 30 but mine was showing still august 28 Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll re email them and see what they say. Or yeah, let me make sure they do that. Okay, and um, this week I couldn't work uh, because of the health issues. Maybe I will work this week. Uh, and that's the reason I was mostly making the documentation work for the whatever I did. Uh, I couldn't train the model. And another issue was with GPUs, which to train. So I took yesterday complete uh, uh, collab GPUs for. And yeah, maybe by next couple of weeks the model will get trained and it will be up and running, and the papers will also be drafted perfectly. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm communicating. I'm communicating. I'm telling all this to Mayuk also. He has aware of the project, what I'm doing right now, what is going and all stuff. Okay. Well, yeah, the papers will be, I think, more iterative. It's it's fine, you know, for right now, because there are going to be a lot of changes made. Like we're going to. Probably we could even have you know multiple versions of the same thing where okay. you know the the stuff you're working on for med sam might yeah, we can start with one and then we might also make other documents it just you know that's the way this kind of works like you have you have the work and then you want to make sure that it gets out there, but you want to do it in a way that's like interesting or relevant to people who you want to target so if we want to say talk to a machine learning audience. We're going to have to use a lot of the the jargon of the field. You know, they have they want technical details. Now, a general audience doesn't necessarily care about that. They want to just use it for whatever reason, you know, and they're not, like, super experienced in machine learning. They will, you know, you want to have that kind of a paper for them as well. But that that's, you know, that's just something we'll work out. Like, we have to work out, I think, the technical details and getting those in the paper. Like as a way to, and then of course the technical details. Sometimes you know they get buried in papers too much. I think, uh, like if you read a, a lot of these scientific papers where they have like all these, uh, you know, supplemental uh, graphs and data and figures, and it's kind of like who? I mean, people read it, but like some of these papers have like two hundred and forty supplemental documents now, and it's like who reads all that? <laughs> Sometimes like they're technical experts who are interested in all of it but no one's really interested in every piece so it's like you know we have to it, we it's like one of those things where we'll be creating things for specific okay. purposes yeah okay i will just make a basic draft which can be modified in future yeah. uh, i think our drive is not a publisher i think so so we can upload our base model there and we can make changes over there if that could be right yeah drive yeah, one thing we should have, of course, is a persistent URL. When you make a, when you put up like code or something, you want to have a, sometimes people will, you know, have, well, GitHub, I guess, is a persistent URL, but a lot of times people will make like a release, like probably at near the end of GSOC, we'll make a release for co the code. And we already have releases for DevoLearn, but we'll make another one. And then we'll also like maybe even, we can even archive it on, uh, on um, you know or one of the archives, the yeah. Yeah, 
So yeah, archive well, archive is for preprints, so we can definitely put a preprint up. But I'm talking about like the data data sets and things. Um, so the, those can be archived separately, and they usually have like data archives where you can make a stub and it gives you a DOI, and then it gives you like you can update the files in it, so people can download it. Okay, I will keep an MIT license over my GitHub repo and I will push it to the OpenWorm Foundation. And the preprint I will upload in the archive as OpenWorm Foundation. Yeah. That should be nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uploading these drafts, I will share it over archive. But right now I will keep it in my repo and I will update with the license in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. We should have, you know, there should be a copy of the code of the license okay. in that same repo so people can have that information but then we'll also have an archive of it and the archives are usually just the releases so like a group will make a release when they get to a certain point there are different strategies for doing that but generally they'll say we're going to make a release now we're this we're going to call this 1.7 maybe it's a stable version and then you put it up in an archive or there's like a little tag in, in github repos that say the latest release and you'll just actually just click on that and get it you'll be able to get the stable version the repo itself will have maybe any changes that are like current so the last push to that repo will be in the repo files and that may not work stably for whatever reason but the the last release should be stable so people will do releases just to make sure everything's stable and then release and then people can download that and then the people can still keep working on the open source. Uh, they can open source the files. They can keep working on the code, and then that's that's not interrupted, you know. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I will do next week, but this week I couldn't work much due to my other issues. Uh, yeah. By October thirty, I'll make everything ready. And, yeah. And the papers will also drafts would be also be ready, and the trade models would be also ready. So. As part of my JSON course, uh, Jyoti would be doing like the online documentation. Okay. Next week, uh, like uh, you have, we talked in the other meeting, right? Like the online doesn't have a full explanation of code and all this stuff. What it is happening under the hood? Actually, we too had a meeting. I explained with him everything, like what are happening in the table. We'll make a draft of whatever is happening, which process we are following, etc. And when these drafts are completed, I will share it with you and you can give it a look, whatever things we need, we can make changes and we can publish in Archive, a preprint can be submitted in Archive and session. Okay, that sounds yeah. good. Thank you for the update. Um, let's see, uh, so Hamanshu posted something in the chat here and it was, uh, in, oh, well, okay, uh, Hamanshu posted, the. Uh, Joss the OJ, so the Journal of Open Source Software. Yeah, that's a that's an, uh, a good venue uh, for papers. You know, the it depend, they have a certain standard for like uh, applicability and use and things. I think I I submitted there once and they didn't want the paper at that point. But uh, you know, the, it's basically where it's the kind of model of a journal where you um you know prepare the code and you push it to their repository and you put it in the template and then they publish it directly from like a github push it's kind of an interesting model for public publication but it's usually these papers on open source software where they're you know describing the work but also you know they have certain standards for like what they find interesting. So it's kind of like a regular journal. But um, then, yeah, the archive is is a, a preprint server. So that's that's obviously a place to go with, with uh, different, with the paper versions. So you can put papers there, but not necessarily code. Although they, they have improved their support for code links and things like that. Um, there is like papers with code and, and things like that that are like archive papers that also have the code and I don't know how that's set up, but um, I know that um, the person in the other group, Ankit Grover is familiar with that because he published, a, he got a paper on the archive and papers with code and all that. So 
we I might talk to him about that. Um, so that, that's, yeah, it's all planning in the planning stages. And then Geothe says, can you suggest any journal publications for cell biology? Now, there, there are a lot of publications, but one of the things in our group is that we ha we're at the intersection of cell biology and computational uh, science, computational biology. So that the, the journals there, are, you know, that's going to be very different from what they publish in the cell biology journals, just in terms of the, yeah, Biosystems is a interesting uh, journal that kind of straddles all of that. It's kind of even more theoretical, but they're different, you know, if you have, uh, and we can come up with a list of journals for a certain paper, but I mean, you know, the, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that a lot of your bi cell biology journals are not going to publish like a machine learning paper. It's just not their audience. And their audience is more like, I did this experiment or I did this observation in the lab. It's 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 kind of an odd thing, but like there are other journals too, like, uh, you know, where they, they do have this mix. But, but this is a thing we'll have to talk about <laughs> uh, well, with some finesse. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thanks for all that, all those updates. Um, yeah. And so we'll we'll be coming up on. I guess we're going to extend the projects to October thirtieth. I'll try to get in touch with the right people at INCF for that. Um, yeah. So thanks again. And um, now I want to turn attention to the uh, uh, genomics of cell differentiation paper. So it looks like there was a lot of activity on that this week. Uh, we had a bunch of, I think we're at version 10 now, right? Um, yes. Yeah. And so we have, Lucas did a last search. And uh, we have, so I'd like to hear from Lucas, actually, if you don't mind. Uh, talk a little yeah. bit about that. Did they? Uh, so, yeah, what we actually, I actually had a, a couple of meetings with Mr. Gordon, and what we came up with uh, was an idea which uh, I'm not sure if I could share the figure 8.13 from Ebugenesis explained. Yeah, I could probably share that. I'm just going to share the uh, screen for a second. All right. Oh, uh, where is it? Yeah, so. Okay, so this is the figure uh, like 8.13 from uh, Embryogenesis Explained by Natalie K. Gordon and uh, Richard Gordon. And this, uh, like these are a bunch of like FZ, FZR, WNT, MAP, micro tubule associated protein. These are like a bunch of proteins. And uh, apparently based on what Mr. Gordon said, they are somehow... Uh, uh, like they seem to be involved in the differentiation uh, in C elegans. So uh, let me stop sharing first. So <clears throat> what we came up with, uh, yes, uh, okay, Dick shared the. So what we came up with was uh, that we might be able to run uh, a blast search for, uh, and after we run the blast search for, uh, like let's say one of these proteins. So what I did, for example, was uh, running, so let's say uh, for, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say uh, for like PKC protein, protein kinase C, um, I, I went on NCBI, National Center of Biotechnology, uh, and uh, I searched in the database like uh, protein kinase C, uh, C elegans, and um, it, like it shows up a bunch of results from, and most of them are the sequences for the protein of, of that time. So like it gives you the protein sequence. And then what I did was uh, I run BLAST against, so when you run BLAST, uh, so like you could search it up. It's uh, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, is, uh, so this blast is technically like a software which uh, helps with DNA alignment or like sequence alignment in general. So what happened was uh, I run I ran blast and I specific I specifically narrowed down.
the results to the taxonomy of C. elegans so that we could find uh, results there. And then I started counting, uh, like, so based on what uh, Richard said, um, Mr. Gordon, uh, based on what he said, uh, when you keep count for each protein, that's going to be a specific enhancement to the paper. And how it works is I uh, it usually showed uh, about 100 hits per each protein. And then I started counting the copies. Uh, so these copies are the N copies. Uh, technically, they are the uh, N copies that have been drifted apart. So, and they, um, they uh, correspond to the N edges of the differentiation tree. Although uh, there is a limitation to this procedure, which is uh, when you run, when you do this, uh, it's not gonna technically show all of the hits. And when you find the significant similarity, the problem is that uh, some of these, like, so I could share, uh, if I could share my screen again. Yeah. Uh, just a second. Uh, so. Lucas, what stringency did you use? I used the, uh, I think it was, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I have to look it up again, but uh, it's the normal settings. I, I don't think it's specified stringency. Oh, I see default setting. Okay. Yeah, default setting. I have to look it up that what the percentage is, but so let me show you what's going on. So this is for, uh, for example, uh, like I ran the last search and it, these are all of the results that it found, but the limitation here is some, that some of them are uh, like, you know, for example, if you look at here, it's technically the same thing that's showing us. And the problem here is that I think the NCBI uh, database is not like that, like how could I put it? Like, it's not that developed. So for example, it, uh, let me go to version 10. Like for DAM, DAAM1 and D, like the dish well, this protein, I could not find any results. And for APC, uh, I think since the amino acid uh, like sequence was too short, it didn't find any copy. So mm -hmm. for some of the proteins, I could not even find the sequence. So that's, uh, I would say that that's like a limitation to, a, to this procedure that we are uh, we were doing, but yeah, that's technically what I did. And uh, Mr. Gordon also uh, sent some interesting ideas, and uh, which I could read it. Uh, like uh, one, uh, he said, look for like, regulatory elements, not gene. And I started looking up for those. Like uh, the blast search is the same thing, uh, but I have to look for those specific elements. And two, he says, reduce the stringency. I uh, have to look that up. And three, he said, see if there is data on expression. Like I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna put this into the chat and then we just look at. Yeah, uh, Lucas, these ideas uh, come from discussion with uh, Natalie this morning. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if three. Um, I'm not again. I'm not sure if I could find the data for three, like for the different stages of development. However, it's uh, uh, it's uh, we could look at this protein. I left a note there. I think it was. Um, Bradley, uh, can, you, can you answer that? Is, for C. elegans, has anyone done uh, the gene expression for individual cell types? Uh, I don't think there's like. Uh, not for individual cell types. I think people have done like studies on s specific cells, but I'm actually going to talk about this in a bit. Uh, what the state of the I think the state of the art is. So okay. yeah, I don't. I but I but that's, that's addressing here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is yeah. So this is all. These are all good. Uh, especially the first one. I think looking for regulatory elements. Uh, so, I mean, this is where a lot of the action's going on, like with the regulatory elements, apparently. Well, it, it could be that whatever, if there is a differentiation code, whatever codes it, right. might be regulatory rather than these expressed genes. On the other hand, uh, Lucas got hits up to, he put it in the default strings, so he got hits up to 40. Yeah. Uh, which is impressive because 
we don't have to, I'm not sure we have to have drift just because there's been uh, a, uh, a duplication. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, four is uh, something maybe you could answer. Are there other nematodes that have been, uh, for which the, lin uh, the cell lineage has been worked out besides the elegans? Uh, yeah, there are a couple, like, I think C. Briggsy and, uh, some other ones, uh, they're, you know, okay, they're different, so, like, they're different cell numbers, and, and I don't know what the available so, data are. Okay, so here's the question. Do you have one that has a smaller number of cell types? Smaller number? To what extent number? can we say that its lineage tree is a subset of the C. elegans tree? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh... I don't know about okay. smaller. I know there's some that are larger, but uh, well, then we can reverse the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we yeah okay. we could compare yeah across uh, Canner habitus. Yeah, so I, I think that if, if we can get anything, uh, it, it's sort of an interesting thing. You have two trees; one's bigger than the other. Is one tree a, similar to the other one in the, in that in the part of it? Is any part of it similar? <laughs> yeah. Problem there is that the I think the nomenclature is different in the different species, so it'd be hard to know if that's the yeah, right. Lineage, yeah. I suppose, but a lineage tree, how, how many? Well, some of the pieces of lineage tree. Yeah. Be a lineage tree. Oh, it I should be. The names but, of the cells could be different. Well, yeah. I mean, the way that the they handle the nomenclature, because remember, these cells or these trees were originally drawn by hand, so. People were right. like just putting okay. names so on them. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're saying getting corresponding cells between two species might be difficult. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, that I don't know. I don't know which uh, depends on, I guess, the nematode that you pick, I guess. But. Okay. Now, are are there any, is there any software for saying how similar two trees are to each other? Oh, I don't think so. I don't know. We could look for it. Um, if not, we might have to invent it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One one word about like the drift part. So like in blast, the results that you get are like matches, like across the sequence. So when it gives you like a percent match, it's really it's a how much it's predicted from the input. So it's like I don't know if that's like going to be different. I mean, there's obviously there are going to be differences in the samples if you go from like C. elegans okay. to another I'm species. Like okay. Uh, there are obviously going to be differences between like, C. elegans and another species, but that there's also this issue of prediction, uh, strength of prediction. So I don't remember what parameter they use, but like usually your match is, you know, pretty close. With protein sequences, it's better than DNA, and the reason for that is the DNA is often when they make when they put together like a genome where they have DNA sequences, you often get like uh, missing bases, like they have to infer the bases from s yeah. using an algorithm or something, and then that, or there are a lot of repeats, and that can be a problem with BLAST. So using the protein sequence is generally better, and it's generally more stable. So I mean, you know, I don't know what those changes, those differences will reflect, if there will actually be drift or if they'll be just like prediction differences. But that's, I mean, that's really good work. I, I'm glad that you were able to get into that and do all that work. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're on to something here. Uh, yeah. We may not have the differentiation code yet, but uh, I think the idea of comparing things this way is good. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, having a, like, a lot of the comparative work is really hard to do. Like, you have to figure out a method for doing it. And, you know, because it's like if you're going across, like, from C. elegans or Drosophila, it's such a big different system in terms of, not just the yeah. nomenclature, but the way that the development, you know, proceeds, although it's the same type of development. So, I mean, you have these parallels, but, you know, one of the things about, like, uh, BLAST and, like, in general, a lot of genomic stuff is that uh, organisms tend to share a, a lot of, like, basic, you know, DNA that involves housekeeping genes and things like that, uh, you know, like, things that make things like cells and so those things tend not to to be different across 
species. So you could compare, for example, nematodes and humans, and there are a lot of pathways that are s similar or the same. So that's why we can do that with, uh, with genomes and with proteins. The, of course, the differences are in some of the other functional things that are specialized for that species. So like that's it like if you look at uh sequence homology between say like bananas and humans, it's like fifty percent. And it's like, you right. know, you would think, well why is that? And the answer is as well you have a lot of meta uh metabolic genes, you have a lot of genes that involve like, you know, uh sig cell signaling and things that are basically don't need to be reinvented. So uh by evolution. So that's that's all great. That's all great. Thank you, Lucas, for that uh, great presentation of work. And uh, so next steps, I'll take a look at the draft. I haven't really, I mean, I've taken a look at the earlier drafts, but I didn't see the latest draft. I don't know if I actually have the right current draft. I didn't see anything in my inbox this morning, Lucas. So if you I could, could uh, send it to you uh, after the meeting. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and the six, pro like the six proteins that I sent there, uh, for five of them, I actually couldn't find the protein sequence. So even finding a protein sequence would be a, uh, I, a protein sequence for C. elegans of like for the protein of C. elegans. Like if you, you could find that, that's that's like a, I could try blasting that as well. But I couldn't even find the protein sequence for those six or five of them. I couldn't for one of them. I didn't find like it was too short. The sequence yeah. of two show, I find yeah, that's a common problem. Uh, often, because it's really what it's doing is it's taking a sequence and it's looking at all the other sequences and it's trying to infer like a match. And again, it, it has some like, you know, it'll make some uh, account account for some of the sampling error. So like when they put together a sequence, they're really some of it is like actual sequence and some of it is inference of of, of what should be there. And so when you get a sequence in, in the database, it's usually pretty clean, but you do have this issue of like getting like an alignment. And so this is where, you know, uh, you'll, you'll have a certain degree of accuracy, but you also sometimes get matches that don't make any sense. And it's just because they're very similar, but, you know, they may be, you know, false positives. So there are a lot of things that, you know, um, that but it's a very useful tool and so yeah and, and no matches just means that no one's put it in the database yet sometimes because you know we only have so many we've only sampled so much uh biology <laughs> and you'd think well c elegans is pretty well studied well not always <laughs> uh and i have a question for uh mr gordon so uh how why should we cross compare with yeast and less complex nematodes? If you could explain the reason and how you came up with the idea, I think that's where Natalie lost me a little bit. So <laughs> ask, ask Natalie the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, one of the I reasons. Gotta, oh. Yeah, I, I I followed her to step four, but uh, I think I was too sleepy to fly. <laughs> People will often use them. Well, sometimes people will use cross-species comparisons to in phylogenetics to root a tree. What that means well, is, I like, think one one of the reasons she brought up yeast is that it has only a few phenotypes. Oh, okay. So you know what the phenotype is in the, or you know what it corresponds to. Yeah, there's 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 the issue of uh, annotation, like knowing what it does. So, like, yeah. uh, what I think in Blast, it'll give you an annotation. Mm -hmm. But the annotations are generally very um, simple. It's not like very detailed information. You can look at yeast if it's c conserved between yeast and C. elegans and see like what the uh, function is in yeast. And it might have, like I said, you know, we share a lot of DNA across species. Yeah. So you'd have like a maybe a corresponding function in C. elegans. Um, yeah. So if it's not like, if, if it doesn't evolve away from that sequence if it's conserved if it just keeps yeah. the same sequence then it probably does have the same function although not always i'm interested in where these molecules are in the cell like the physical placement uh oh, well the speculation is in that figure <laughs> okay yeah 
Right. Okay. Uh, so the figure 8.13 in the in our book. Oh, it's figure 8.13? In the 2016 book, not yeah, in the 2000. Uh, uh, Lucas, perhaps you could make a, extract that figure and send it to uh, Bradley and, uh, and Susan. Oh, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, just a second. Okay. Yeah, so that's, and then, yeah, so yeah, the, the compara comparative stuff is usually to root the tree and or to like find function or there's, there are a lot oh, yeah. of ways you, yeah, reasons you do that. Yeah. Would it be on onerous to ask you to uh, find papers on the uh, lineage tree of other species of C of uh, Oh yeah, I could do that. I have some. Yeah, I kind of know what they are, but I have to go put together some okay. papers on it. <laughs> okay, yeah. And then uh, we need we need some precise values for the number of, of, of different cells and the number of identical cells. Great. Yeah, I'll see what okay. I'll see what they have in the literature. Uh, yeah, and then Lucas, you know the parameter values. Sometimes, if if you play around with them. Uh, you can get different results. It, I don't know what, how you played around with the numbers. Yeah, um, oh, thank you. Are you referring to the E value? Well, the E value is like a significance value. So the E value is like basically, usually you don't worry about the E value because it's always like pretty small. And like what it's doing is it's just getting a, a statistical significance. And so mm -hmm. it's not exactly that, but it's basically the same. But I mean, like any parameters that you put in for like the uh, percent, like a criterion for a percent match, if whether you put it in or you're just using it. Um, uh, I use default setting, but I have to check that. Uh, but um, if in terms of, are you also referring to percentage identity, like when it matches? Uh, I think that's also something that it generates. So yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's all. Those are good. I mean, those are good things to have in the when you have when we publish an analysis, for example, you want to have those numbers there, like in the results. So that's yeah. good. But like, uh, if there are any input parameters, I don't know what the input parameters are on the window there, but uh, what you're using. But like, if you do make different, if you do searches with different parameters, uh, input parameters. Then you should make note of that. And no, I did not. Like okay. in that specific case, I did not change the parameters or like the input parameters at all. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that just just as a note, <laughs> when you have when you're doing these analyses, if you do like if you do them under a certain set of conditions, make sure that everyone knows what they are. Because uh, yeah. when you go to publish them, it's you know it's like with the machine learning stuff. We have to have like technical detail, but but you know it's it makes a difference sometimes, uh, and then you know sometimes I don't know if it'll make much of a difference of changing input parameters for you know I mean you might have a specific question where you ask you know uh, a very specific question with respect to input parameters, but I, it's generally just you know make sure that you know what you started out with and what the uh, results are. And you know we'll, we'll probably make like a table or something to show um, what we're getting. But that's yeah, great. I'll take a note of cells. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, and I'll look into the literature on the cells, cell IDs, and the different types of different or the different types of lineage trees across species. I know that they're in Canterhabditis, which is the genus of uh, that of our interest. There are a number of um, uh, nematodes that have been studied. They're not model organisms, but I think they understand the lineage tree. Uh, but again, the, the nomenclature is sometimes different. So it's, it's, you know, it may be something that is uh, easily comparable or not. I'll have to find out. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, take any two real trees and can you match them and say, oh, these are species, at least of the same species, or this is an older species than the, than the other one? Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. The, uh, yeah, there's an implication here that if we could match the differentiation trees, then we might actually be able to uh, date when different species occurred. Yeah. Okay? 
Yeah. So I think that a lot of work ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to go over this deep dive that I did on uh, differentiation. Last week I talked about um, the stuff with um, methylation. And this is a different type of data than what Lucas was looking at. So Lucas is looking at the output proteins. So what happens, of course, is we have transcription, we have a promoter region, we have a gene, a promoter triggers things on the gene or expresses certain parts of the gene. And then you get like, uh, you know, a protein made from that. So what, but what controls transcription? And what controls transcription are these epigenetic things that, uh, you know, control the openness or the closeness of the promoter. So this is where methylation comes into play. Now, what I talked about last week was the standard model for like in stem cell research, which is mostly in mammalian cells. And what's interesting is that in mammalian cells, there's this assumption of global regulation of uh, methylation state or global regulation of state. So what that means is that all across the genome in a certain organism, if, if you have a cell, it's a stem cell, and you have a change in methylation state, so this, these methyl marks will change their state to sort of drive the thing towards a certain differentiated state. Um, and we talked about bistability and all that. That's kind of an aside to the main idea which is that, in general, in a cell, every gene will be regulated in the same way. In other words, they're going in the same direction. Every every promoter will be regulated or primed towards this uh, differentiated state. And so that's that's what we have in mammals. And it's it's very interesting that that's actually maybe not the case in C. elegans, although maybe it is. Now, we don't know this for sure because apparently the... Um, Literature is a little bit scattered, but uh, let me go through basically what we have in terms of uh, genomes for C. elegans. So C. elegans was, uh, you know, the genome was sequenced before the human genome, a couple years before. There was a draft sequence or a draft genome that was put out in 1998 and published. So there's this uh, genome sequence for the nematode C. elegans. This is the C. elegans sequencing consortium and they put out a 97 megabase genomic sequence which in the original uh, version revealed over 19,000 genes. So the number of human genes predicted by the human genome sequencing project was something like 20 to 30,000 and they keep revising the numbers they, they refine the, the sequence. So what happens is they put a draft sequence out and then they refine it. This is not that far off from what we have in humans. People thought a long time ago that there were a lot more genes in humans than in, say, like other organisms, especially the what they call the lower organisms. But that's actually not true. It, it seems like C. elegans in humans have, you know, within an order of magnitude similar genes. Now, the size of the genome is different. And certainly, if you look at the C. elegans genome, and I don't know if I have a copy of it here, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a couple of chromosomes and I think a, a sex chromosome. So there are one, a couple of autosomes and a sex chromosome. And the C. elegans genome does not have, the genes themselves don't have centromeres. So that's, that has implications for this global regulation. Oh, this, is, this is where we get a lot of our information about uh, gene expression data. So this is the genome sequence. Uh, and then this is, you know, where we get have like a a, a bunch of, uh, you know, genes that we can sequence in DNA, and then we can make uh, we can infer proteins from this, or we can actually get the protein sequences. Um, that that's where we're getting that. But this is actually from Encode. So there was a, a part of the Encode project which is called Mod Encode, and that was part of the project where they did did a lot of they collected a lot of data on C. elegans and Drosophila. And so they make these comparisons between the C. elegans and Drosophila and um, humans and mice, you know, so there's this broad comparability uh, aspect. And so, you know, if you can, you know, do experiments in C. elegans, like say for aging or for other types of things, 
we have like the the genetic pathways we kind of know what they look like they're very similar in humans because like i said we have a very high degree of similarity for such different organisms and then we can make you know inferences uh they have these things called you know homologs and paralogs which are how you know you get like genes that are similar uh in different species and they have different names but they're basically doing the same thing uh this is an example of what we have in, with the modern code data set, which are these these data that have been generated on, uh, these are gene expression data. So this is ChIP-seq data, which is where they, uh, it's this next gen sequencing where they put a sample on a chip, they sequence it for each uh, oligonucleotide, they get a sequence and they get a sort of a uh, an amount of that uh, sequence that's expressed. And then they uh, compare it against the genome and they try to find these little stretches of DNA and how intensely they've been expressed or how intensely they're in the sample. So we can say a lot of things about um, gene expression using ChIP-seq data and other types of data. Um, this has a lot of ChIP-seq data in it. So this is all, uh, this was something that ENCODE did. And the reason they did this is that they wanted to infer function from the genome of these different species. So the methodology was that if there's a transcription factor in association with the promoter, that promoter region that that's expression or that that's function, and they they had different. Uh, there was a controversy about how they define function, but basically those data exist. Um, this is BLAST, of course. This is the Wikipedia stub for BLAST. I don't know how much I need to go through this for people, but Basically, this is the, the origins of BLAST. We're trying to find a way to compare DNA sequences and make this comparison between similar DNA sequences. So this has been around a long time. Um, and you can do this through the uh, GUI that, like how uh, Lucas did it, you can also set up BLASTs on like a cluster or uh, even on your, I don't know if you can really do a good job on your uh, laptop or uh, desktop environment, but you can set it up so that you have like the database in a FASTA file. You plug it into the program, it runs usually a command line thing, and then it will, uh, you know, give you your your matches. But of course, you know, that's going to take a lot of memory. So using the GUI is probably good enough for a lot of this sort of thing. But if you're doing like a, a you know, a sort of a genome-wide assay, or a survey, this would be, you know, installing it on your machine is uh, good. And this just explains like how this process works. So it's really, you know, comparing two sequences and finding a match. Uh, it's inferring matches from this, it, these pairwise comparisons and it's calculating a score, which is then the degree of match. And then it's generating that, uh, the value where we talked about, um, where it's it's evaluating the, the I guess the significance of the you know the match, and it, or the result, and it gives you a score, a similarity score, which is how similar are the two sequences, for reasons you know like I said, for reasons of sampling, for reasons of other reasons, these aren't always going to be a hundred percent. So we want to take note of when they're not a hundred percent, and and you know that can be it, it's not usually a problem. Uh, this is, of course, in worm base. So this is worm base specific. This is an NCBI. If you have trouble, Lucas, in finding some of the protein sequences on NCBI, you might try worm base. And this is uh, wormbase.org. And this is tools blast blat. So this is a blast blat search for specifically for C. elegans. Uh, this is like based on that uh, C. elegans genome. So you can actually choose the version of the genome that you want. The latest is WS288. And you can do the, the uh, sequence uh, search. Uh, they're actually different bio projects. So the VC2010 genome was done in like 2019, and it was just a revision of that 20 or that 1998 uh, genome. And so th this is a tool specifically for, so that you have the E-value threshold, this is the e-value that we talked about. You can just threshold it at, I think there's a default value, but this is the, the number, the significance. And then this is the 
database, you know, it's usually BLAST-P, but you can also compare nucleotides versus proteins. Uh, yeah, and then this is finally, this is the C. elegans genome assembly. This is, you know, on an on NCBI, so we can get the whole genome if, if needed, but I don't think we need the whole genome, just to let you know what the state of that is. Uh, there are a bunch of comments in the discussion here. Uh, so we had, uh, okay, uh, yeah, we're talking about the figure. Then uh, Dick has two citations of the Stell State Splitter. Uh, and yeah, the, no, Bradley, those are two papers we did on stem cells. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. I remember those. This is the Lukai. Uh, and then, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. So that's, and then, so then I had this other thing thing that I did on the deep dive where I talked about where I was thinking about this problem of these different methylation patterns across the genome. So um, so what happened basically is that you have this problem where in mammals you have this global control. So you have these methylation marks on the on the promoters and they all sort of go in the same direction. With C. elegans, however, that's not the case necessarily. And this is the same in Drosophila. So C. elegans has what we call a mosaic form of development, which means that instead of having like this, these cells that respond to cues and, and, and uh, you know, differentiation cues in the environment, the cells are de deterministic in terms of what they're going to be. So you can take a lineage tree in any one cell from its developmental state, which is usually a stem cell state, will differentiate into a certain type of cell. So if you take a cell out of that lineage tree, you can remove whole bunches of adult cells. There's nothing that will like make up for it, as you see like in mammalian development. So this is something they call mosaic development. But apparently there's also a mosaic form of methylation. And originally they didn't think that C. elegans had methylation. They thought that it was restricted to mammalian cells. But what they found is that in mammalian cells, uh, you have this global regulation, and then in C. elegans, you have this mosaic regulation. So um, they, this is uh, kind of talk. I have a couple of papers here. I'm not going to go over it too much. This is mosaic methylation in clonal tissue. This talks about some of this, where if you have a tissue type, you can have uh, this mosaic regulation of methylation. So you can have cells within the tissue that are sort of maybe can jump to different states. This methylation isn't like stable always uh, over uh, tissue. So, you know, you have this global regulation in the genome in mammals, but even in mammals, you have this sort of variation across cell cells in a tissue. Um, and so that brings us to C. elegans, where they have apparently they have these clusters of place locations, or these clusters of methylation marks, and they tend to be in the promoters of genes. And this will allow for uh, you know this sort of differentiation in in different cells, but it's mosaically regulated. So you know there are certain places in the genome where they're the methylation marks are in one state in another part of the genome where they're in another state. And if you think about uh, this mosaic development mode, it makes sense because this not all cells are going to end up in the same state at the same time. Sometimes cells will differentiate early into neurons, for example, and sometimes they'll differentiate later into muscle or into something else. And so this, this paper is on induced neurons from germ cells and C. elegans, and it talks about actually inducing this process and some of the things that they do with transcription factors and they're actually using directory programming here they're talking actually they're, i think this is just a review where they talk about our current knowledge about this so they're using this kind of approach with c elegans and they're showing that there are these differences between mammalian cells and c elegans there are also these what they call hot regions which are uh, regions in the c elegans genome that are CPG rich. And the CPG again is the cytosine to guanine transition. And that's what they, they look for with these methylation marks. 
So you have these sequences that are CG, CG, CG. Sometimes they're, you know, in this kind of what they call a microsatellite or a satellite, and sometimes they're just in the genome. Now, in the promoter regions, you tend to get these satellites where you get these long repeats of CG. And that's where you get these this sort of uh, methylation act activity that affects differentiation because it changes how the gene is accessed and, you know, it, it changes what's regulated. So this talks about these hot regions. They talk about them in C. elegans and humans. And this kind of, this work kind of sets up this difference between C. elegans and humans in that respect. So this, uh, they, they find that there are these regions where you get these clusters of these CG repeats. You get this higher potential for uh, regulation uh, that's based on maybe like cell differentiation and um, that you get differences between humans and C. elegans in terms of the stability across the genome. So there's a lot of work in this um, in this paper. Okay, so that's uh, the mosaic methylation work. Uh, this is the genome. And then there's some other papers I got on um, you know, this one, CPG islands and regulation of transcription, basically driving home this message that there is this, uh, that there are these areas of the genome that, or these air, these methylation marks, which are epigenetic, that regulate the promoters, that then regulate the gene gene expression. But we can actually identify the state of this, or the potential state of, of methylation and, and this change from the sequence, because the DNA sequence should have a lot of these CG repeats. So the idea would be that if you have a lot of CG repeats somewhere, there is a potential for differentiation and regulating uh, cell state. And so that's that's what I found in my deep dive. I was really interested in that because I thought, well, you know, this is in the all over the literature. I, I knew about mammalian cells, and I wasn't familiar with C. elegans. There's some other papers I didn't put in there on like people doing work on specific cells in like the vulva, where they actually looked at the genome of different cells in the vulva. And to answer your earlier question about the cells that we have, like for or the data we have for specific cells, people will do stuff like that where they'll like sample a couple of cells in an organ and they'll look at the genome or they'll look at, you know, maybe just uh, do some work on not not an entire genome sequence, but like specific genes, and then they'll actually look at the function between the cells. But I don't know of any study. I don't know if we have like the entire genome for each cell. We just have like these data sets that are kind of like for you know whatever people people ask a question and they generate a data set, and that's what exists. So that's that's it. And then you know and back to this paper with the. Uh, the vulval cells, they were able to show that these different methylation states actually govern the sort of differences between vulval cells. So there are actually two cells were in one state, two cells were in another state. And, it, you know, they were both, they were all in the vulva, but they had different functions. So this is, again, you know, something that, uh, I, you know, it's a, maybe a different analysis from the proteomics, but that's, that's something we can put together in, in, in the paper. I think the missing part of this, of course, is the uh, differentiation code. And we did some work actually in the differentiation code um, in 2016. Our paper in 2016 on uh, it, it has a, a title that's not really uh, what I'm looking for in this paper. But I we did do some differentiation trees for C. elegans and for Siona intestinalis, which is a C squirt. And we generated those in this paper. And we evaluated the lineage trees with respect to differentiation. And there were some other things in here. But the thing that I wanted to point out here was that we did work out uh, some uh, something about the differentiation code in these type of organisms. So this was a mosaic organism where we had uh, reorganized the lineage tree, um, and then we did this cast analysis, which is kind of like a blast. It's just analyzing, like, I think, oh, yeah, like, basically the differentiation code is this binary code where you have these binary divisions, 
in the lineage tree and you attach uh, binary numbers to them. And the binary numbers get larger as you go down the tree. And then you can take like a certain level of that tree and you can take another tree and you can compare the sequence of numbers. So if you have like, uh, you know, binary numbers, uh, they're, they kind of act like in computationally in the same way as a DNA sequence or a protein sequence. And you can actually align those and you can get a score. And so that's what we were doing here. We were generating a code for the different nodes of, of the differentiation tree, which is a resorting of the uh, lineage tree. We were comparing level by level different trees or different formulations of the tree. And then we were getting a score for the matches between those two trees. So we could actually get like a sequence and its alignment. And so that was the way we approached in that paper. Um, I don't know if that's, maybe that's, so, oh, go ahead. Uh, so that might help us with the, uh, what Dick was looking for, like the comparison of the differentiation trees. Yeah. Would, would it work? But I don't know, I could not find the software. Like, could you find like oh. a specific software for that? We didn't, yeah, we didn't write software for it. <laughs> we did, I mean, that's not going to be the same as like a blast, but we didn't write software, a formal package for it. We just kind of did it with uh, some code and some sorting, you know, as, uh, if we could write up some code or we could write up some software for it, for what we're doing here. But I'm just saying we don't have the, the software. <laughs> it doesn't really exist. It's just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, software operations. It's not really something you can release to people. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that's, I mean, that might be a good method uh going forward but i don't know if that's the best method so we might okay yeah so yeah, yeah. understood yeah no problem okay now i'd like to say a few words about uh methylation and cell differentiation so the first thing i want to talk about as i mentioned uh these uh, cpg islands so the cpg islands are these very small motifs of c to g so it's like c and g It's a two base motif, and this is a very short motif. And so you can have these kind of paired together in different parts of the genome, right? And then those are kind of all over the place, uh, but they're clustered in the uh, promoter regions, as I mentioned, these HOT regions that you observe where they're clustered in uh, functionally relevant places like a promoter region. And they open and close the promoter so that you can the transcriptional machinery can get access to the DNA and the gene. You also have these longer sections, and this is where we're getting into our um, our patterns here, or our richness of these uh, CPGs, and that is where you get something like this, which is what we call a satellite or a microsatellite. And this is a term from genetics where they talk about satellites. And the reason they talk about it this way is because the way they've discovered it was by running an electrophoretic gradient where you have bulk DNA. And then you have these bands or satellites of CPG um, content. And so this is, you know, this is an electrophoretic gel. So it's running in this direction and things segregate out along that gradient according to their molecular weight. So you can actually pull out, sometimes pull out different types of proteins, different types of uh, DNA sequence. And this is the way they used to do this before a lot of the modern sequencing technologies came about. Well, that's an aside from the point of this, which is to say, that we have a promoter region and we have a coding region and that promoter region may have these CPG islands where you get a methylation state. You have methylation marks and they're usually H something, right? That's the nomenclature they use. 
So in the literature, you'll see a methylation mark. It's H3 something or H6 something. And that's just the, the mark that's on this site. So you get enough of these in the promoter, and you have a lot of places where this is the case. And so these sites are the, the site of regulation. You can have them open or closed, or they can be in a bistable state, which we talked about last week. So if it's open, that means that you have this uh, transcription of a gene, or you have a transcription of some allele or something from a coding region of a gene, and it makes a product, it makes an RNA, mRNA. If you have, if it's closed, of course, then nothing. It's closed down. If it's bistable, you can have something making other, like, different types of products. And so this is something where if we have a, a gene, for example, that's involved <clears throat> in making muscle, like MyOD, you can have this uh, switch on that gene on the promoter, and I can turn it on and off or can turn it on and on in different ways so that it's making different products and it's it's making more of a certain mRNA than it would otherwise. So this bistability allows it to be poised to turn on and off during the process of development. And so this is what we mean by when we say bistable, um, that it can be in, in either state. And the thing I mentioned in the meeting is that in mammals you have global regulation. So in mammals, you have global regulation of this. All right. And then, so that means that everywhere across the genome in a cell, these marks have the same state. So there's a switch from being a stem cell to being a precursor cell to being maybe like a neural, neural cell. All right. And this makes sense because you want to have these, um, you want to have this coordinated across the genome because you have these different intermediate states and you have this uh, complex signaling that happens in cells and they sort of, they, they have a, a great plasticity as to what they are. So if you put a stem cell in a bunch of muscle cells, well, it'll become a muscle cell. Or if you put them in a culture of neural cells, it can become a neural cell just through signaling. You can also reprogram the cells artificially and get a similar result. Um, but in C. elegans and in Drosophila, you have this mosaic. You have mosaic uh, regulation, which means that there's, it's local, I guess you could say, local regulation. So local regulation is where it's on a gene-by-gene -gene basis. And so this is this is important for this type of development because in this type of development we have a lot of cases where we have these deterministic lineage trees. So we have these lineage trees that might have like you know two daughter cells, and those it might go from this level of development, and all of these cells coming down like this will maybe contribute to the uh, to the epidermis in a different parts of the different tissue. So fate is restricted by sort of the level of developmental cell. If I were to take up this developmental cell, for example, I'd take up this entire part of the lineage tree and I would basically deprive the organism of maybe of one half of its body. So you'd end up with an adult looking like this instead of the worm that we're used to. This is in C. elegans. So this is uh, so this is definitely in, in cells can't fill in the gap. So you can't produce more cells here. You can't proliferate more cells to make the back end. Whereas in a human or a mouse or a mammalian system, you could do that. So this is the difference. And so the methylation marks are just ways to regulate that process to keep these cells deterministic instead of you know um, I, I don't know what you would call. Um, it may be regulative, where you can regulate cells to a new fate as you need to. So this is all kind of the background for this, and um, hope you learned something. All right, finally, I'd like to talk about the differentiation code, as we talked about in the meeting. 
So briefly, in our 2016 paper, we defined the differentiation code as the outcome of a reorganized lineage tree. So what we did was we took a lineage tree. So a lineage tree has, um, you know, we have mother cell, we have the daughter cells, and we have these binary divisions. I'm just going to do a four cell tree to get give you the idea. Now, these are divided usually. This is a anterior, posterior, basic anterior, posterior orientation. So in C. elegans, you have the anterior cell and the posterior cell. And then in this four cell example, you have two anterior cells, two posterior cells. And they're organized by like nomenclature and by um, these, like one of these posterior cells is going to go on to form the germline and another posterior cell is going to go on to form specialized cells in the intestines and the muscle and um, some other things. And then the, the anterior cells are going on to form most of the epidermis, well, some muscle, a lot of like uh, cuticle and things like that, and neural cells, of course. So this is how it's structured. What we do in a, this is a lineage tree. What we do in a differentiation tree is we actually organize this by size. So these cells, instead of being anterior or posterior, it's going to be organized by size. So this is larger and smaller. This is largest. This is the larger of the two here. This is the larger of the two here. And the reason we do that is because in the sort of the way that they've originally built this model, and this was on regulative embryos, the tissues were of different like they're these expansion waves and contraction waves. So the larger are the expansion waves and the smaller are the contraction waves. And so when you're dealing with tissues in a regulative embryo, you know, you're going down the tree like this and this like the, the group of cells is either contracting in size or expanding in size. And so this is, say, a contraction from here. This is an expansion from here. You're either like, you know, uh, the, the shape and the, and the form of the thing is either an expansion or a contraction. So the expansion is usually on this side. The contraction is usually on this side. In, this, in, the, regular t or in the mosaic embryo, we had to take some liberty with that to say that the larger cells are on one side, the smaller cells are on the other. Well... And the consequence of this is you end up with a different topology. It's shifted from the lineage tree so that you don't really care about the anterior posterior orientation. You care about this uh, size orientation. And so we're just using single cell size as a method for that, at least before we get tissues. So we don't have tissues at this stage, they're just cells. And so tracking the sort of the developmental cells versus the terminally differentiated cells. So this is the way we did this um, in 2016. Now, that means that you have an interesting problem here, which is that you have, you can create a binary code from this reorganization, but you can also create a binary code from the, um, and I hope I'm doing this right, but it, I think it matters to this case. You also have one for the lineage tree. So you have one for the differentiation tree, one for the lineage tree. That means that for this four cell example here, we have two codes. We have one that's the original code, and this is just like a reference alignment. And then we might have one where we have something like this. So this is the differentiation tree, this is the lineage tree. Okay, all right. So then what we can do is then we can take those two trees and see how distant is each level. So we can actually look at this level here too. So we can say 0, 1 and 0, 1. Let's say that there was no change. So the uh, anterior cell was actually larger than the posterior cell. So if that's the case, then we have the same uh, concurrence between the two cell lineage tree and the two cell differentiation tree. And so there's a distance of 0 there. We use what they call Hamming distance from computer science characterizes. So the Hamming distance is zero here, which is great because we, you know, it's interesting because 
we, there is no difference between them. In this case, however, there's a big difference. And that big difference is uh, where you have, it's basically, I think everything has changed here. So there's a distance of four. So that means that it's maximally distant here. I don't think this was the empirical result, but I can't remember. I'm just giving you an example. In any case, this gives us like a basis for comparing trees. So it doesn't have to be the lineage tree and the differentiation tree. It could be two different differentiation trees. It could even be two lineage trees, although the lineage trees um, don't vary in this way. So it's really useful for either comparing it with a lineage tree or comparing it with different, like maybe samples, different individuals, different species. And so then we actually have this code that we can compare and align. And this, this code increases, so it's a binary state. So as you get to the 8 cell, the 16 cell, the 32 cell, the number of binary digits increases. So it's like you might have a 3-bit or a 4-bit or a 5-bit number. And you have a longer and longer set of sequences to compare, but you can always do it at the same level. It should work. But now we have this problem where these are just the cells in their state. So what we're looking at in the paper in 2016 was just characterizing the cell size and its its, its reorganization in the lineage tree. So it's order from left to right, all right, which is fine. Except that now we don't we only have the information for cell size. That's our sole criterion, and we also have the information for lineage, but that's sort of implied in the structure. Well, what we need in this case, and we're looking at genomes, and we're looking at protein sequences and so forth, is we need a way to map those changes onto this tree structure. And when we realign them, you know, having those states like also realigned. So the realignment isn't the problem, it's characterizing the state differences where the things that define each cell. And so this is where we're kind of uh, at a sort of I think an impasse right now is that we don't know how to make that mapping. So each cell has like this, I don't know, this content. It's like an n tuple of what? So traditionally we've used spatial location, x, y, z, t. This is our five tuple for usually what we, how we model these trees. So like we might have like uh, three dimensions of spatial position, one dimension of temporal information, and then this uh, variable that measures maybe some other factor. It could be some uh, summary of molecular data. It could be something else. Um, but that's maybe not enough. Maybe we need to have multiple entries in here where we have like a, a huge list of attributes that are at the molecular level and, so, and to be able to summarize those into this parameter. But, you know, maybe we need just to pick one parameter and build a tree, each tree having one parameter, and then get a, a distance. So you're getting a hamming distance that would um, be suitable. I guess I'm trying to figure out how to model this here in my head. Um, something like this versus something like this. So this would have, you know, a distance. And this, this would be uh, representative of some molecular attribute. We could even reorder it instead of left to right or largest to small. It would be like um, presence or absence of a certain protein. So it would be like, you know, protein that we don't know what the name of it is. Is it there or not? Or what's the state or whatever? Now this complicates things because we don't have single cell data, as we mentioned in the meeting. So this might be a problem, but I hope it's not. But we can we can we can arrange this in different ways and get a result that maybe is informative to people. So do we have anything else we want to talk about today or? Uh yeah, I'm just wondering if we plot number of hits versus stringent, stringency. When it peaks at a certain stringency, does that mean anything? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it just means, I guess, that there would be, like, uh, fewer hits with a higher stringency, I would imagine. But, um, it, well, oh, it, would, it may not peak well. Well, I guess, yeah. You, 
if something is more maybe more common across, like if it can identify things that are more common across different samples in the database, uh, which you know is not like everything in biology, but it's what's in their database. So this, yeah, there should be a curve that rises and then plateaus. Yeah, it should it should vary based on like how common that is in uh, in the okay. yeah. Okay, so if we find if it's a, if it's a plateauing function, then if we find the stringency at which it plateaus, we can see if that's similar or different between different molecules. Yeah. 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 Okay, so there might be a classification problem there. Yeah. Handle. Yeah, and then of course not all matches are going to be relevant. Like sometimes you'll get matches that are like something's totally different, has a different function, and you don't think it's like relevant to what you were getting. Because you know you you think about like sequences are like combinations. So protein sequences this doesn't happen as much, but they're kind of like combinations of in, in DNA sequences they're combinations of four characters. So you get like if you get a small sequence. You can get a lot of noise. You can get a lot of things that aren't relevant. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess for the proteins, at least, we know their length. So we know, we know how much, uh, we know approximately what length we're trying to get a match to. Okay, well, I'm really good. Lucas can handle this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I can. <laughs> well, but yeah, let's see what's going on. Yeah, if if there was a software for uh, if that comparison, that would have been interesting. I mean, um, uh, yeah, but this the thing, the problem with the matching in general is even when you uh, run like protein to protein class. Sometimes it shows you duplication of results, like they're the same thing. Right. But like I put it as non-redundant, I want non-redundant results, but it still shows me the same thing with the same percentage identity. But when I look up, I see that, uh, yeah, sometimes it's from this different lo locus of oh. the same same thing. So that's why it sometimes it shows you the duplication. So I'm not sure about the curve thing that you mentioned. So uh, that might be a problem then, but yeah, I'll look, I'll look, look that up later. Okay, Lucas, one suggestion. Uh, we're writing a paper here, and your list of things that you put in the paper needs to be turned into proper English. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, that's uh, like a uh, like version ten is like a uh, like a. Uh, I didn't want to like I wanted to put it in a different document, but I just attach it as like details there. It's not. The part of the paper yeah. I have to. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 It's been written along yeah. with uh, what you're doing and what the conclusions are. Yeah. yeah. There's a specific way of to write up results or write up methods. Um, it's it's yeah, but that's something you'll learn here. So it'll be fine. All right. Uh, that's that's great. All right. Okay. <laughs> well. Thank you for attending. See you next week. Okay, okay good. Right. Good session. Yep, thanks. Bye. 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 Now I'd like to go over a few papers that have come out uh, that have to do with some of the things we talked about today. So the, actually, this paper has to do with some of the things we've talked about in the past few weeks on uh, human embryoids and uh, sort of making human embryos outside of the normal process of human development. So there have been a host of papers in this area, uh, and it's really kind of been a breakthrough uh, uh, recent times. So this, but this paper actually focuses on some of the things going on in that stage of where the inner cell mass is forming from a blastocyst. So you see the blastocyst here, it's kind of moving out. You have the inner cell mass, the trophectoderm, and they're arguing here that they're able to find, using live imaging, nuclear DNA shedding during blastocyst expansion and biopsy. So this is the blastocyst up at the top. It's, it's starting to 
form this uh, trifecta determiner in our cell mass, and then that's where that's the the sort of the stage of development that we're in. And so this is the um, what I'm pointing to here is the graphical abstract. So they're actually live imaging this. They're putting it in. You know, they're live uh, doing this live imaging technique. They're getting images of this. They're able to see th different things that are going on here. So one thing is mitosis and segregation errors. So as cell division is occurring, you're getting errors in mitosis and errors in chromatin segregation and segregation of the different parts of the cell as it's dividing. So the contents of a cell uh, split apart and move towards the poles as you get uh, cell division because you're going to eventually get two cells and they're going to pull apart. So that you have to have, you know, basically a copy of the DNA and the contents of the cytoplasm or the inside of the cell. And so that segregation process is happening here. So you're observing errors in that. You also get this nuclear DNA shedding during expansion. So as the cell structure expands, as you see here, you get this DNA shedding that comes, nuclear DNA shedding, that comes in the, in the uh, I guess, in the nucleus of the cell. So the nuclear DNA kind of comes off and sheds. And then uh, they do this biopsy, and you get more shedding here. So the highlights of the paper are they're using a fluorescent dye assay, which means they introduce this dye to stain the things that they're interested in, so you can see them under a microscope clearly. Fluorescent dyes enable live imaging of human embryos without genetic manipulation. So they're able to actually use a dye. Now they have things, if you're familiar with uh, voltage dyes in neurons, so they'll sometimes use voltage dyes to reveal electrical activity instead of using transgenes or instead of using like uh, other types of assays like uh, recordings or uh, electrodes. So these dyes are actually quite flexible. These are actually introduced uh, into the sample and they're able to pick up some of these things. Uh, the alternative would be using a, a GFP or YFP transgene and so that, that has its own challenges in, in these live samples. Uh, live in, imaging reveals differences between human and mouse embryo morphogenesis. So there are differences between human and mouse morphogenesis that they're able to do. I guess they also sample mouse cells that have the similar mode of development, but you're able to observe the differences there. And we talked about that. Uh, in terms of genomics today, but they're also in cell biology. You have these systems that you can compare. They have different processes going on, but in like human and mouse, the processes are similar enough so you can get a sense of the underlying sort of process. Uh, the underlying sort of the, I guess, the, the underlying conditions. Uh, blastocyst expansion causes trifectoderm, so nuclear budding and DNA shedding. So you get this nuclear budding here uh, in this image, um, and then you get the shedding that comes from this budding. So, uh, and then mechanical stress from blastocyst expansion or biopsy triggers nuclear DNA loss. So basically what they're arguing is that in this process, you're getting nuclear DNA loss. You're getting these mitosis and segregation errors. And this is something that you know, has has implications for, uh, you know, uh, genetic anomalies in development, perhaps. So that's why they're interested in this. So this paper, you know, there's a lot of technical detail here I'm not going to go into just to show that this paper exists. Uh, this is from Cell, and this is a recent paper, uh, 2023. The other paper I want to talk about is this uh it's from the bioarchive. It's probably, I don't know what conference it's going to be at. It's probably going to be at a conference. Uh, this is called Synergizing Geometric Deep Learning and Data Centric Methods for Improved Protein Structural Alignment. So, we were talking about protein structure and protein sequence alignment. Uh, we've talked in the past about some of the tools that they use for protein folding and, of course, alpha fold, which is uh, uh, machine learning technique for looking at protein folding. This is protein structural alignment. And in this case, they're using geometric deep learning for this. Uh, so the abstract reads, structures are replacing the role of sequences. 
So as we saw in the MOOC meeting, we have these sequences that have a certain amount of information. They're good for conveying what was transcribed and translated from the DNA. So the DNA structure tells us what's in the genome, but then that gets transcribed. Certain parts of that get transcribed. Uh, generally, the sequences that of interest that get put in the uh, in like something like NCBI or some other uh, centralized database are things that are biologically interesting. So they're usually things that get transcribed. Um, and so we get this, uh, we have this uh, different, um, different alleles or different uh, isoforms of, of, a, of a gene and what's being expressed by that gene. But then we also have translation, which means that it's being turned into a protein sequence or an amino acid sequence. And so, you know, we're interested in the uh, work that Lucas was doing on the amino acid sequence. But there's also the structure. And then we have the structure in RNA as well, where there are folds and there are uh, turns and there are other types of topological features that are functional. They have functional significance. So a small RNA molecule might be a straight line and it's a sequence. But in <clears throat> larger RNA molecules, you have secondary sequence or is secondary structure that actually the sequence in in alignment with its structure is the information of that molecule. So this is what they mean by this sentence. Traditional bioinformatics research focuses on sequences because they were easily obtained. Um, and so this is, again, the sequences, you can get them uh, from studies. There, there are ways you can do mass sequencing, so it's it's cheap to do sequences. It's not so cheap to do structural analysis, and so this is why you can get sequences more readily than structure. Advances in techniques like cryon electric micro electron microscopy, molecular modeling, docking algorithms, and structure prediction software have shifted the focus to structures. So there's there's microscopy that that happens that you can get the uh, you can actually do X-ray crystallography as well. You can get information about the structure of the protein, uh, but cryo-electron microscopy is a little bit more modern than X-ray. And so this is just a way to get the data so that you can actually model the structure. But then, of course, once you have the structure, you need to model it. You need to understand how it works functionally. And so that's where a lot of this <clears throat> stuff comes in, molecular modeling, which is where you have a three-dimensional model of the structure, docking algorithms, which are you know, when you have uh, 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 a cleft in the protein, you know, there are different things like electrons that dock in there, and those are biologically important. And so that's important to know how those work. And then structure prediction software, again, this is protein folding. What's the conformational state of that uh, shape, and is it biologically viable? So all those things are necessary to know. And you can get these structures actually on uh, NCBI or some other resource, and you can model them in uh, in software. So there are different software packages for protein modeling. There's actually also something called Nanome, which is a, a VR-based uh, protein modeling saw platform where you can actually pull <clears throat> protein structures up in front of you and play with them, um, and you know do all of these things that you can do in traditional programs. It's really interesting stuff. So this is something that we're moving towards. Now, given the importance of deep learning in many of these breakthroughs, it makes sense to also explore how it can modernize classic bioinformatics tools. So this is, again, you know, we, we want to know if we can apply deep learning to some of these new, or, or graph neural networks even, or geometric deep learning, I guess in this paper, to some of these older techniques, and they're older only in the sense of relative old, <laughs> because we have these, these are like maybe 10 years old, a lot of these deep learning methods. These other methods, like molecular modeling, are maybe 40 years old at most. And then uh, X-ray crystallography or some of these other techniques you use to get the, or the protein structure, maybe 70 to 80 years old, or maybe a little bit older than that. But the point being is that it's it's uh, you know not a uh, really old science, but it's moving forward.
So, uh, however, empirical findings have shown that machine learning based methods have many pitfalls resulting in over optimistic conclusions, including data leakage between test and training data. So again, in, in our <clears throat> typical uh, deep learning model, we have test and training data. We test um, our data on what, what we've trained on, and we can only, our model is only as good as the training data. And so this is a problem that, you know, we, we they're trying to kind of get around. This is a caveat, especially with biological data. Um, thus, there is a need for new innovations to make neural networks more intelligible. So in this uh, paper, we have developed Van Gogh, a geometric deep learning based structural alignment approach that performs on par with the state of the art without ever having been trained on a pair of naturally found homologs. So we talked about homologs where these are um, analogous genes or analogous proteins in different species, or they're analogous in terms of being duplicates. So these are homologs are where they have a similar function, they're just divergent in some way. We adopted a data-centric approach to address deep learning and data limitations by augmenting protein templates in, into synthetic homologs for training. Our method allows us to supplement homolog data by knowledge-driven augmentation, self-learning relevant structural features by supervised examples, and protein alignment that is competitive with state-of-the-art methods. So let's break this down a bit. Um, so they want they have homolog data, which is kind of the standard in proteomics, where you have, you know, comparisons between, say, species, and it gives you sort of what we saw in the blast searches, where you have two different sequences, and you're trying to infer like the relatedness of the two sequences or the similarity, um, and so. It doesn't tell you a lot about function. It doesn't tell you a lot about like this sort of evolutionary homology necessarily. It's just that similarity. And so we need to have more information here. So knowledge driven augmentation is something where we know something about the proteins and their function and their, and their context. So we can apply that as data augmentation. We also know a lot more about its structure. Uh, we, we can supplement it with sequence information or functional information and we can even you know backfill this with uh, molecular simulation from other uh, sources so we can actually augment our data set in that way there's also self-learning of relevant structural features by supervised examples so this is typical of machine or deep learning and machine learning but not necessarily of typical or, or, or traditional uh, protein modeling so they, you know, they use these supervised examples, these supervised learning to provide this information to the algorithm where it can learn new structural features. And this is very basic deep learning stuff. So this is not like anything new, except that in this field, it would be an advance. And then this is some in protein alignment that is competitive with state-of-the-art methods. So along the way, you're, being, you're able to align proteins with Use you know in comparison to other methods using these sources of information, and it will give you uh, a result. Now they don't talk about the improvements that they've made necessarily in the abstract to traditional deep learning methods. So there are some caveats that they're getting around. I guess they're using these, they're bootstrapping this with, with training and with uh, data augmentation to get a, a, a good result. So this is the. Uh, Graph neural network framework that they mentioned. This is github.com deep rank, deep, deep rank core, tree, main deep rank core. And that's the place where you can find the code for this. So that's, uh, those are two new papers that just came out. Thanks.